on guys, so today what I wanted to do is take you through one option. I, I got a lot of, I would say, uh, feedback and messages when we do these things, but like one option of programming structure of training. Now I say one option because there are so many different ways that once you understand the principles of, I would say, adaptation, that you can make, you know, you can change things up, right? So and we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Now, you guys know, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, I would say, Mike Robertson system. Uh, going through the R7, I've talked about this before. So, you know, the, the focus of today, and even you guys see me like go through my training session, um, and, and I'll explain a little bit of how, you know, that plugs into this, is, you know, I'm still filtering everything through this R7 system, right? So, release, reset, readiness. Those are, when we talk about release, it means like soft tissue release, right? Uh, resets are basically, either autonomic reset, meaning breathing stuff, or we're gonna do PRI, we're gonna do some things that are gonna either reset the joint where it's supposed to be and also our nervous system, right? And then readiness is our kind of dynamic warm-ups, like how are we gonna get ready for the specific task at hand, which in this sense is gonna be the training session. And this is where the multi-phase dynamic warm-up comes in, like those three kind of plug into the multi-phase dynamic warm-up, which I've talked about before. I'm gonna go deeper into like a separate presentation uh, one time just talking about this. But what I'm gonna really focus on is R4 through R, R6. We'll talk about a little bit of R7, which is reactivity. That's just like I would say dynamic work, meaning either elasticity, power output, things like that. Um, actually, and then resistance, which is gonna be our main thing, like our, our training session, whether we're working on you know, building strength, building muscle mass. We'll touch a little bit on resilience uh, and recovery. So our resilience is our conditioning. And like I said, I, got a, uh, I would say I got a great say video kind of uh, coming up with Joe Jameson talking more about that and going deep into it. So we're going to go from, you know, that multi-phase dynamic warm-up, which we're not going to talk, uh, talk about as much, into what the training session would look like. And, you know, starting with a power primer. Now, power primer, like I said, this, this is one, getting your nervous system fired up for a specific thing. And it, when we look at our strength-based movement, so that's gonna be our, our, our main strength-based movement, whether it's, like I said, the different patterns, push, pull, you know, squat, hinge, single leg as well, which you guys will see that in my training session I was doing today, Bulgarian safety squat bar, Bulgarian split squat hold, uh, uh, not holds, but I say just split squats, and uh, for like pretty lower reps, like four, to, uh, four, five, six reps, like really, really heavy weight, but it was, a, it was a unilateral movement, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the primer, in this scenario, you actually saw me do that in Swiss ball hamstring curls, right? I was just priming, uh, priming, I would say, that posterior chain, and getting it fired up. Nothing crazy heavy that's gonna exhaust it, but just priming it up. If I was doing a deadlift, it might be a bent over hinge position with a lap pull down, right? And really like squeezing that. So now we're priming that same position. And if I was doing a bench press, it might be face pulls, right? So I'm gonna prime that bit main, main movement. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about this because, you know, because I, I said one option, that it should the strength base, you know, should power and strength always be first? Well, it, they don't need to be. What you'll find is that like in, you know, I'll say my older age, but with people that have been kind of through the, the ringer a little bit, I actually like putting certain exercises in before that big main exercise. And that's perfect, we find a lot of people feel great about that. So meaning, like imagine I was doing hip thrust as my first drill, and I was doing some blue hand raises in my second drill, but th and then later on I'd go into a trap bar deadlift, right? where most people will say, well, shouldn't you put your trap bar deadlift first? It depends, right? Depends what the goal is. If you are, you know, uh, wanna improve strength, but really you, but you wanna feel healthy and not be in pain and like all those extra sets get you going and you actually feel better later on and yeah maybe you might not lift as much weight but over time you're gonna get stronger put on more muscle and, and, and not be in pain remember when you're in pain if you're injured that's the thing that is the biggest detriment to uh, getting results because there's no consistency consistency in that but in this case like I wanted to give you guys a, a kind of a blueprint that if you wanted to take so we go with our primer and then we go into our strength-based movement. Now, like I said, uh, it doesn't have that could be your squat, your bench, your any type of heavy pull, your hinges. Uh, but don't you know? Don't just get locked into that because once again, the tool can be very different. You see, I don't do a, a lot of back squatting anymore. Um, 
how you safety squat bars, front squat, double kettlebells. You can go super heavy sandbags, right? The tool can change and you have to adapt it to the person. So don't get stuck in that. Cause here's, you know, there, there's some uh, kind of points that I wanted to cover here is, you know, the myth of linear progression of strength and loading. Uh, you know, over time, you're not gonna always, I would say, just linearly progress and get stronger and, get, and, and build muscle. It doesn't work that way. That, that's a myth. So we have to kind of understand that. Also, the goal is pain-free training and progress. And I call it the infinite game. Actually, Simon Sinek calls it the infinite game. Infinite game of life and business. There is no winner, right? Unless, look, if you're going to a powerlifting competition, there's a winner, right? We know the rules of the game. The game is finite. And there is the person that lifts the most weight at this category is the one to win. But in life, it's an infinite game. Like, what if you bench 315, okay? And you, but then you blow out your shoulder and then three for three years, you're, you're, you got neck pain and back pain and this, that, and the other, right? Like, it means, it's, the infinite game means constant progression. And the progression might change while at one area of my life, I might wanna be like really, really, really strong and powerful. And like I said, I was playing basketball, so I needed all these different properties. But now, hey, I don't need to deadlift 600 pounds, right? But hey, I wanna be strong, I wanna be lean. I wanna be able to do stuff, play sport, go for any type of hike I want. I wanna be out of pain. Because when I'm out of pain, I can continue to train and I can continue to have a physical power that I can then apply into all areas of my life. It's an infinite game, right? And remember, you gotta earn the right to hit PRs and lift heavy, right? Earn the right. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of, I would say, high quality reps, like perfect form, or should I say, kind of chasing that unicorn, right? So going back now to, because I think this sets a good foundation when we go into this model of strength-based movement, here's some rules, right? Like I said, don't sacrifice form for more load, right? I call them, we, we talk a lot about form PRs, right? So in our semi-private training or small group training, somebody may have lifted the same weight over the course of, uh, I don't know, the you know, four-week block that we did. But at the beginning, let's say they were able to front squat, you know, 200 pounds for three reps, but their reps were like, oh, they're rounding and they're coming out of it all funky, right? Imagine that by week by week four, they're lifting 200 pounds. Perfect form, nice and controlled down, pause, coming back up. Same weight, form PR. But the thing is, we never want to sacrifice form. If that person in that example was lifting that 200 for three, I would we wouldn't let them, right? We'd reduce the weight so they would get the perfect form. But what should I say as close to it? Of course, like we're always improving. But what I mean by don't sacrifice the form is just to get more weight up, don't allow there to be shitty reps, especially not a lot of shitty reps. If, if there's comp day, like for instance, if you go to powerlifting meet, you know, you might have that like crappy, like rounded deadlift, right? Cause you're just kind of getting that PR and, it, and it's a one time or a couple time thing. But in general, we want to have thousands of super high quality reps, okay? Be open-minded to movement variables. Like that's what I was talking about. Uh, I'm a big fan of, Obviously switching up, like not being locked in into, okay, I'm gonna do barbell bench, I'm gonna do barbell squat, I'm gonna do barbell deadlift, right? Those are my movement patterns, right? You guys saw like, I used as a main strength movement, a single leg Bulgarian with a safety squat bar, right? And I like to alternate those because like I said, loading bilateral movements really, really heavy, consistently over time, usually beats up the joints, right? So you gotta know how to switch it up as well. Also, once again, See, I was, I, was, I was ahead of myself. Don't, don't be set, dead set on barbell lifts, right? Just, especially like straight barbell. If you look around the gym, you'll see we have every type of tool, like neutral bars, duffel bars, safety squat bars, um, swivels, like everything that can improve or, or you know, um, help with joint stress and not have the joints be so banged up. And don't train a failure all the time. Like majority, like does that mean in every training session, you should train hard. Right? And there's gonna be sets where you're gonna go to like, a, where you have a couple of sets where you're gonna push it. That, but that still means like technical failure, right? Very rarely should you just, I mean, you definitely shouldn't be training every rep, every set, uh, you know, in, in every workout to failure or close to it. And I, I know this is like, I was a, a knucklehead and I used to push that and that's not the smartest thing ever, right? But that doesn't mean you're not training hard, right? It just means you're training smart. After your strength-based movement, we're either gonna have a supplement strength or a primary hypertrophy-based movement, right? So now, once again, this depends on the goal, right? If somebody's really working on strength more, we might supplement 
that uh, that first movement that we did, for instance, if we did a deadlift, what's going to be a supplement movement to that, uh, like for instance, a trap bar deadlift. Well, it might be a d dumbbell bogan split squat with a pause, right? And that might be the supplement strength movement, or it might be a hypertrophy. So we're just gonna, dependent on the rep ranges and what the goals are, right? So for instance, here, a couple of things that I like to, to throw in when it comes to uh, especially hypertrophy movements. We're gonna have multiple escalating uh, ramp sets. So I like to do ramp up sets for a number of different reasons, right? It, neuro, first of all, warming up the system. Neurologically, you start ingraining quality reps, right? If I do two to five sets, uh, ramp up sets. So let's say my, my, main, um, my main work set was three sets of 100 pound dumbbell bench presses, right? I get two to five sets to work up to it. Now there's a couple ways I can do that. I can either go, you know, 10 reps at 35 pounds, and I can go eight to 10 reps at like 55 pounds, and another at like 75 pounds, and you know, maybe another five, six reps at 85 pounds, and then I hit my, my main set, right? That's one way to do it. So now with great form, I've added some extra volume with really good form, not banging up the joints, kind of get warmed up to my main sets. Another way that I can do it is like have that last uh, set actually be heavier than the set I'm gonna be working with to like bump that neuro activity up, meaning I might be ramping up and my last set before I do the three sets of 100 pounds for 10 reps, my last set is like, a, uh, you know, two to three reps with 120 pounds. Right? Even though I could probably do more, but now it's like the nervous system obviously is more engaged and then the uh, hundreds feel a little bit lighter. So there's two ways to do it, but the key is like, do the ramp up sets. The ramp up sets are gonna add more volume. Now with most of the, I'll say hypertrophy work, we're looking at eight to 15 reps, sometimes more, right? But th that range is a good range. Our rest is gonna be about 45 to 75 seconds. Now is that set in stone? No, because like if you met really, really, really strong people, if they do 12, 12 reps, of a, and I've, I've seen this happen with like 12 reps of a 500 pound squat, you're not resting 75 seconds, all right? You're resting a lot more than that. But this is, like I said, this is a good rule for most people that we train and we've seen it gives you some boundaries. But like I said, whatever I say, somebody's gonna go like, but what about this example, of course, right? That's why I said options, okay? We can, with tempos, we can focus on control eccentrics. We can focus on powerful concentrics. We can focus on peak squeezes, you know, which I love it. Whereas like you do your last rep and you squeeze at the top for five, 10 seconds. And there's a lot of different, you know, obviously positions that we can do this with. We can do stretch position training. Imagine an incline dumbbell bench press where we're here at end range and we're squeezing. We're not, we're not resting on the joint. We're at end range of the muscle and we're squeezing. And then we have isometrics. And now there's two types of isometrics. There's overcoming isometrics and there's yielding isometrics. Overcoming isometrics are more of a, I would say, used when it comes to strength training. So imagine like I'm sitting on, on a bench and I put pins on a bench and then I take an empty bar and push it into the pins and push as hard as I can for five to 10 seconds and then come back down and then go again for like maybe two to three sets inside of that, right? That's not gonna be the greatest, I would say, at building muscle, but it's incredible for building strength. For hypertrophy, we're gonna use more yielding isometrics. So yielding isometrics are, like I said, pauses. So imagine I have you know, a double kettlebell squat, I'm pulling myself down, and right here I'm pausing for five seconds every rep, right? Or maybe I'm doing a regular set, right? And at the end, my last rep, I'm holding for as long as I possibly can, right, then coming out of it. So those will be yielding isometrics. Right, when it comes to rhythm, when it, and with hypertrophy, muscle building, we think about like constant tension a lot, okay? So controlled constant tension and the mind-muscle connection, which has been proven like that, that it matters, right? So meaning, if I'm coaching somebody through and telling them to squeeze, so let's take a dumbbell bench press for, in, for instance, and they're controlling down, right? And as they're coming up, I'm telling them to squeeze an imaginary balloon and feel your chest. Okay, so not banging them together, but as an imaginary balloon, and I'm squeezing that imaginary balloon, and I'm pulling down, I'm constantly squeezing, right? There's gonna be more tension in my pecs. It, it, and like I said, same thing with biceps, right? My muscles are thinking about it, right? I mean, and obviously like the old, the greats, Arnold, all those guys like knew that before it was kind of proven with science, right? So, so this is just kind of, uh, I, I would say a good 
marker for uh, you know, our hypertrophy based movements. Okay, from there we go to a second hypertrophy based movement. Let's say it's optional. Well, optional because first of all, you know, like you can have a great program without that, but once again, giving you a foundation for something to use if you're not sure. Because like I said, there's endless program variables. Matter of fact, I actually, I'm gonna flip this around real quick because a couple of things that uh, I wanted to touch on when it comes to the key strength movement variables, okay? So that's the, that's the loading. We talked a little bit about loading. There's types of reps and a set focus. And the, the thing is, you know, do we wanna focus on power? Do we wanna focus on strength? Do we wanna focus on hypertrophy? Metabolic stress, right? From there we have tempos, eccentric, concentric pauses. We talked about that, okay? So for instance, with eccentrics, what, what are some benefits that you know anybody can get from those? Well, unlocking mobility restrictions. Like we love using RDLs. Like imagine if you have, you know, I say tighter hamstrings. I say tighter hamstrings, but you're you only have so much range. If I'm squeezing the dumbbells, crushing them, pushing the ground away, you know, we can we can go in a slow eccentric and get like a loaded stretch that feels very, very, very good and also improves stability and coordination. Right, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. We always teach that, right? A lot of people like push through the reps and make them go fast because they can't control the slow. So we like putting these centers in for that. They build muscle and strength. We know this, right? And also many times can improve dysfunctional patterns once because you can kind of correct as they're moving slow. So actually, a lot of people will self-correct when they have to move slow, which is fantastic for that. So a couple of things on a, a, that, that I want to talk about these centers is it's extended phases of three to eight seconds per rep. Our target time and attention for that is about 60 to 120 seconds, so one to two minutes. If it's shorter, we don't want to necessarily make it shorter. Now you want to sprinkle it into the program as a novel stimulus. You don't want to put eccentrics just all over the program and tons and tons of sets of that, right? Because they are pretty challenging and people can get sore from them. So that's why I say, hey, well, these are the movement variables and the loading tempo variables here. That doesn't mean that you just throw them in for everybody everywhere, okay? Now, the things we like to emphasize with the people that we see, for most people now in the 21st century, is hamstrings, pecs, lats. Why? Because they're usually shortened due to posture, right? Because we're sitting here, we have shortened pecs, we have shortened lats, right? And tight because we also have an extension. And of course, hamstrings, because hip flexors will usually be tight a lot too, but we'll, we'll, we'll go into that in a second. So, RDL, you know, we'll use RDL variables, push-up variables, vertical pull variables like pull-up hangs. I would say you could do hangs with, um, with cables and things like that, right? Now, once again, notice how I talk about like, it depends. And I draw these, I drew this like little pie here. And this is just a, a, an example, right? What's the focus, right? Imagine if you had a pie and you have like strength, muscle building, you have power, you have, for instance, movement slash mobility. Right, which one is the, like, if you want to equally focus on it, uh, on, on all, you know, then you have kind of like this concurrent training model, but maybe there's more focus on strength. So then you'd adapt that program, like we just said, right, be a strength movement, then a supplement movement, then a primary, for instance, hypertrophy movement. And I'll show you guys, like, the, uh, the, the rest on that side of things. But on top of that, we have, you know, all these smart superset options that we can implement, right? So we said, hey, it's goal strength and hypertrophy. Those are goals that go together well, meaning like, hey, get stronger, go size. Pretty smart goal, right? So for instance, if your goal is get a ton stronger, but also become the most conditioned person on the planet, those two goals don't go together, right? Like I want to do a powerlifting meet, be the strongest, and then run a marathon. And I'm not saying there's not people that have like some crazy, crazy, that can do some crazy stuff like that, but I'm talking about like, is that optimal? And then we have hypertrophy plus metabolic stress, good goals. What's cool is that, you know, power mobility, strength and corrective stuff. If, if I know that somebody wants to get stronger, but I got a bunch of stuff going on, I can program for that, right? We can put in fillers in, in those different areas, right? Where we do a filler where, for instance, they're doing, you know, uh, I say quadruped thoracic rotations, but then they're doing some type of pressing movement that's gonna get them stronger, but not beat them up, right? They might not be doing barbell bench press. So this is important because it, you know there's endless options. Like this is this is really really important, right? There's endless options in any time I talk about programming and structure. Like I said, I like to give structure and boundaries, but at the same time, like we can break the rules. But we have to understand the principles, right? We have to understand the principles 
and the focus. Like, what is the goal of the person that's doing it? So, and at that, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of break down like just that training session that, that I did to, uh, you know, in, in, in the video that you guys will see to give you a little bit of an idea how it fits into this. Okay, so from there, notice like from number four, we go to primary metabolic stress, right? Metabolic stress is fantastic for a number of reasons, right? Like, let's look, let's look at the benefits. Okay, so metabolic stress, and, and I'll explain how this looks like. So if you've ever seen something that has like super high reps, accommodating resistance, uh, not like necessarily crazy loads, but like you get a lot of the burn, like that's what it would be. But what it does is increases muscular stress without a lot of joint stress, right? Because if I'm not taking like really, really big loads, that's not gonna bang up the, uh, the, the joints as much, right? But we're gonna get a lot of muscular metabolic stress. So things that we can use is accommodating res resistance. So bands, right? Bands create constant tension. So if I'm doing a, you know, a squat, banded squat in some form or another, when I'm going down, it's pulling me. When I'm pushing up, I have to constantly work against it, right? From there, we have cumulative training stress, just like rest, like uh, manipulating rest periods, right? Meaning really, really short rest periods, rest pauses, things of that nature, like ultra high rep schemes, 15 to 50 plus, right? Intensity techniques. So inter and intraset stretching. So if you guys have ever seen like, you know, do a dumb, uh, dumbbell bench and then do an intraset stretch long period of time and then keep it going, right? Rest pause sets, right? We do it for, for a little bit, we pause for a really short amount of time, we go again. Escalating sets, blood flow restriction training. So you guys have seen that, right? We restrict the blood flow and then it doesn't really take much weight and we know that that has positive benefits on, on hypertrophy, okay? So when we look at that, well, what do we want to do? We definitely want to do multiple sets and we want to ramp up. So both working sets and your ramp up sets are going to be high rep here, right? Increased rep range, so 15 to 50 plus. So if you guys have seen any of the band, you know, the, the, the tricep crushers, 50 reps, sometimes even more, um, that would be, that would fall in line with that. Constant tension with peak iso holds. Right, so constant, constant tension, things like pulses too. So, uh, you know, if we do, for instance, uh, you guys have seen it probably maybe in classes, where we're doing pulses, goblet squat pulses, right? Just that bottom rep, constant tension, right? For high reps, 20 to 25. Also, short rest periods, like 15 to 45 seconds. So this is a lot, this is one of those things where you don't have complete recovery, you go again, but you can't because the loads are not that big, okay? And also, joint friendly variables, right? Joint friendly variables. So maybe you wouldn't pick, first of all, it depends on the person, but you wouldn't pick something that a person has a tough time doing, right? Because as soon as we start going to those high reps, we don't want the form to break down, okay? And we want the joints to be centrated. Meaning one of the things that, you know, tends to happen is like, if I'm doing a high rep, does, you know, I don't know, it start becoming really, really horrible. So we don't want that, right? We still want to have great form when it comes to this, okay? From there, stretch-based movement. So this has been really, really beneficial. And I almost want to say like, this is a lot of kind of what we use with a uh, majority of the population. Once again, many different options. Don't get kind of completely zoned in on this. But what's great about stretch-based movements is this. Imagine like loaded stretching and quasi-isometrics. I've used these for uh, over a decade and I actually started probably 15 years ago with some of the loaded stretching that I learned from Pablo Sassoula directly, which has been great. But here's what this does, okay? It can help with mobility, so enhances mobility. It improves strength and hypertrophy. We know this is, as well because it's a great response. It's joint friendly and it builds resilience, a little bit of mental toughness as well while being safe, okay? So the thing about this, you only want to do maybe like one or two sets max on it. Now, you want to hold it as long as you possibly can, but at least, and, and, and keeping it 45 plus seconds. So if you're picking something that you can't do for, for instance, 20, 30 seconds, it's not going to be a good fit for this. And here are some examples. Accentu accentuated uh, range of motion split squat. So imagine if my back foot is on a split squat, my front foot is on a plate, and I'm holding this position. And the thing is, as I'm holding this position, eventually I'm going to start, like 45 plus seconds in, I'm going to start getting exhausted and wearing out. Now it could be loaded, but it just could be body weight. And I'm gonna keep holding and try to hold it, but I'm, as I'm holding it, I'm still dropping into that, into that stretch. And so what we know is that those quasi-isometric stretches actually stretch certain fibers when muscles are under tension. 
which you can't do with passive stretching. You just can't do it. Push up, iso hold, slide incline dumbbell benches, right? When we're here in a slide incline dumbbell bench and then just holding. What's important when it comes to that is to know we're trying to get to the end range of the muscle. I'm sorry, it has to be end range of the joint, not end range of the muscle, if that makes sense, okay? Because the end range of the muscle, the joint's gonna be in a crappy position, right? The joint, it has to be end range of the joint so it's safe and centrated. Pull-up hangs are great. Dumbbell RDLs, we talked about those. Uh, if somebody can't have grip for a pull-up, it be a lap pull down. Same thing, like if you're doing a pull-up hang, you don't wanna be all the way out and just hanging on the joint. You wanna be in the joint and then letting the muscle stretch under load. Okay, big, big, big difference. So loaded stretching movements are, are a great, and the thing is like people, even though they're, they're mentally kind of challenging, people feel great after this. Okay, they feel great after this. From there, we go to finishers, which I have a question mark on them based on, you know, what do we want to achieve? Uh, who is it that we're programming for? You know, but what's great about this, the challenges can be like core pillar base, they can be targeted muscle base, they can be even conditioning stuff, right? But who doesn't, this is one of those things like where you can plug in for what the person likes, or wants extra work on. Arm part finishers, leg finishers like the leg matrix, right, where it's just body weight and the burn is, is crazy. Right? Uh, carrying variations. We love far, you know, different carries, but not just farmers carries, but all carries, rack carries, you know, or mixed carries. Heart pulse ramps, loaded movements, or targeted metabolic stress. And those kind of can kind of, uh, I would say, gel together sometimes. And then sprints are just traditional conditioning, which once again, we then move into, you know, just cardio uh, and energy system training that, that is, has its kind of own pocket, which we'll talk about more later because you know, where, where should this fall in? As we go through this, the question that comes up is, hey, how much time does a person have to do this program? And like, see, that all falls in line with starting at the kind of with the end in mind, right? Maybe a person has 45 to 60 minutes. Okay, what, what is gonna be the big rocks that we can fit in here? And that's where maybe the finishers in the cardio are really all in one, right? So how can we, we superset certain things? Those are all, like, like I said, all questions because you can make the best program on paper, it doesn't matter if a person can execute it. So that's where it's very, very, very important. And then at the end we have recovery. And like, you know, this is one of those things where uh, you, in a workout, look, you can either do it right after, six hours post-workout is probably ideal, but for most people that's just not realistic. Right? It's just not realistic. Where you can do it on off days. And some of the recovery stuff, I mean, like, look, it, put it this way, the, the off days, you, you don't want to have to worry about this as much. It's going to be things like lists, which is just like steady state cardio. But global soft uh, myofascial release techniques, which is like things like foam, foam rolling, using different implements, where we want to get things like lymphatic drainage. We want to get active muscle pumps, you know, parasympathetic response. Now, what you can do is like we have, for instance, Norma Tech recovery compression stuff that we'll, we'll put on, have our clients put on that can do this. Uh, but like I said, using foam rollers and soft tissue tools, you can do that yourself. The key is just not to, you know, how do we start recovering as fast as possible uh, and not like just get done with a training session, jump into our car and just drive away, right? And or on, I said, non-training non days, how do we recover, right? Because from there we have biphasic stretching and like these are also like these long one, two, three minute stretches that can be very beneficial. Flow mobility, which I love and you guys have seen me do tons of flow mobility. Uh, and, and I like it as aerobic work, meaning you know, 120, 30, 40 beats per minute, not crazy high intensity and just moving, right? And just moving through the ranges of motion you currently have. And it listens just, like I said, long steady state cardio, um, you know, under 120 beats a minute. Walking is still phenomenal. Right? Walking is one of the best things that you can do when it comes to that end, right? So if you broke down a training session like this, you have a pretty damn good structure of it. And, you know, using those, I would say, main movement patterns. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip here to just break down. So for instance, our, well, my training session, uh, which was a lower body training session, and I'll touch on that a little bit in, in a second, whether it's lower, upper, full. Uh, but I started with dynamic warmups, uh, which you guys, we, we talked about that like multi-phase. Oops. Dynamic warmup, right? So this is me, dynamic warmup, okay? And, and you kind of see me going through that. Now from there, I did what I was talking about, that primer. Okay, you see the primer? So hamstring on the 
Swiss ball. Now, obviously, I'm writing this kind of quick, so you guys, it's not my, 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 my most beautiful writing like the one uh, earlier, right? And I would go 1A, and then 1B would be my main, my main basically strength movement, which was Bulgarian split squats, okay? Now, and it's with barbell, Bulgarian split squats, okay? Now here's the thing, right? You guys saw me saw use that transformer bar because one, I can keep a better position, get my lats nice and tight. So this is another example of using the tool to be able to better fit the person because once again, direct barbell on my back, you know, heavy loads, keeping this here just stresses me out more. But my, my rep range there was four of six per side. A couple I got fives because I, I went really heavy on this, right? So that was very, very challenging. Now here's one thing that I didn't mention earlier, but because of time crunches, like a lot of times, how do I fit in reactivity? I like doing contrast training, right? So a heavy lift followed by a explosive movement. And so here I did single leg box jumps, okay? And that was for four sets of four per side. All right, so we did single leg strength work, which I said that I like to alternate you know, phases of like, this is a squat pattern, but instead of doing a double double bilateral squat, I did a single leg squat, but still going really heavy. And to cut down time, and obviously we know that, that basically heavy, heavy lifting can accentuate your nervous system, which can then help you use, uh, I would say jump higher in, in that instance. From there, went to number two, which was double kettlebell squats. And here's the thing, right? A lot of times, so if I'm doing a, a heavy bilateral, then I do a, a unilateral afterwards. But if I'm doing a heavy unilateral, I go bilateral afterwards. And here I went four sets of eight. Like, so still pretty heavy, right? Number three, here we started using some of those hyper, so this is primary, right? We could look at, at this as uh, the primary hypertrophy because that's kind of like my, my focus here, okay? Then the secondary hypertrophy here, oops was hip thrust. Now with hip thrust, I started doing some, because I was doing a 108642, which is basically I do 10, you know, a set of 10, pause for five seconds, rest, pause, training. So we, we, talk, we talked about like how we do intensification strategies for hypertrophy, that's what I was, was using. I went three sets on this one, just doing pauses. Now. Number four, we went to the metabolic stress. I went with dumbbell walking lunges, and I went with uh, pretty heavy, but I went for, for high reps here, right? And, and doing pauses at the end, so when, at the end when I would stop, I'd uh, hold that position as well. Number five was kind of a finisher, because I went EMOM every minute on a minute, KB swings. Okay, which I'm progressing over, over the weeks. Now, as I'm writing this out, you guys kind of see this, it's, it's, it's a little wacky, but the point of it is, is like, how did that fit in with what I talked about earlier, right? It fits in pretty, like, pretty structured in that way. Now, with that said, you know, I still, I'm a big fan of, I would say conjugate training, meaning that my favorite split is, you know, two upper, two lower days a week. Um, and as you know, like, or maybe you don't know, but in conjugate training, you have maximum effort day, you have dynamic effort day, oops, and then you have repetition effort day, right? So maximum dynamic and then repetition. So these are different focuses and different intensities. You don't have to use all of them, but I'll give you an example. Many a times, I might do lower body. Uh, so for instance, maximum lower body day, right? Which where I might be deadlifting or squatting, that my main lift, then I still go through that sequence. I might have then a maximum upper body day, okay? Where once again, it might be bench press, it might be a chin up. Now, if I had a focus of also increasing my speed and explosiveness, then I'd add a dynamic lower body day, which I currently do. I still want to feel athletic. So on those dynamic lower body days, I might do a uh, you know, band resisted, for instance, deadlift, or I might do a, uh, you know, an explosive power trap bar deadlift jump, or box jumps, weighted box jumps, right? Some explosive type of movement 
And then the second exercise might be a unilateral lower body movement. And then I'd add another repetition day for upper body. So example, if I wanted to go to get stronger, bigger my upper body, get stronger and more explosive in my lower body, I might have, like I said, lower, uh, lower body max, upper body max, lower body dynamic, upper body rep, right? But you could also do lower body rep, upper body rep. There's a million, like I said, the options are endless, but I, I love, I'm gonna do a whole separate thing on how to use conjugate training for any goal, because even if you're doing a full body day, hey, guess what? You can have a max effort, full body day, a rep effort, full body day, and another rep effort, full body day, that is, that is a mix, but different intensity. Because once again, you cannot train at high intensities at all times, right? That even, even the weeks when we train, we progress them. And there's a lot of different ways that you can progress them. So you can go, you know, in week one, it's like a new program, and you're working at about, you know, 60, like 70% of the intensity, right? Week two, you go 80%. Week three, you go 90 Week four, you crush it, you PR, you go all out, and then you start it all over again, right? Because we talked about, like, the infinite game about progressing long-term. With, with, I would say, the conjugate model, what I love doing is having week one be a heavy, high intensity, week two is a medium intensity, week three is very high intensity, and then week four is a deload week, right? So it's like a lower intensity, and we go back into the next program. So once again, many, many different plant ways to do this, uh, and I'll talk more about this, but I just wanted to give you guys more structure and, and, and loop back and kind of finish with, like, this is something that, you know, uh, I, I talk about as far as like an off-season athlete, but imagine this could be an off-season, you know, athlete life and a client where we're just looking at the holes in the roof, right? Everything on that other side that we talk about, what are the holes in the roof, right? What, what do we need to improve? And like I said, for, for a, I would say a client that wants to get leaner, stronger, this, that, the other, we're gonna look at those holes in the roof and then we're gonna adjust that plan and reverse engineer. So it could be poor maximum strength or, or for a lot of athletes, and people in general, it's relative strength. Poor strength speed or speed strength, like hey, what do they need more of, right? Poor explosive strength, right, of force development. So imagine a person that just can't explode that zero to 60. Okay, we're gonna have to work on that. Lack of reactive ability, can they not respond or react super fast? Okay, insufficient mobility stability. Which one, both, right, what do we need to work on here? Structural imbalances, right? Do they have like a lot of asymmetries and bad positions and we need to work on those. Technical flaws, that's just like technique, you know, um, first of all, technique should not be addressed under, under a lot of fatigue, right? So we're gonna drill, and we even talked about that, like why do we do ramp up sets? Like there's a lot of conversation we still need to have with that, but that's really, really important. Excessive body fat, you know, for anybody, but for, if you're an athlete, imagine just having a weight vest on. It, there, there is no functional carryover, right? Like, you lose body fat, you have less weight, and if your strength stays the same, your relative strength goes up. So very beneficial is to change that. Soft tissue restrictions, now that can, you know, we can work on with our tools or outsourcing or say referring out to, you know, physical therapist or soft tissue specialist, right? And then we're gonna look at existing injuries that require either rest, rehab, you know, but like we wanna cut off the high intensity sessions when it, when it comes to that, because we don't wanna reinforce bad technique, or we don't wanna bump high volume. Now, you can still train around it, and that's what we specialize in, but how can we still keep progressing somebody that's dealing with injuries uh, and make them better and get into recovery? And then just general qualities and foundation, you know, maybe G GBP. So we always wanna look at like, you know, and, and, and like I said, I, I mentioned athlete here, but it really could be anybody, you know, what are, what are we looking at? And when we look at excessive body fat, you know, we probably have to dive into nutrition and lifestyle factors and all these other things that are, are important that I've talked about before that are a whole nother segment and section, but kind of gives you an idea a little bit of the breakdown of those things. So hopefully that has been helpful. Hey, always love the comments, share what you love, share what you'd like to hear more of because I try to create the content that you guys want to hear and get insights from not only you know how I program, how we do things here at Vigor Ground, uh, different different ways that you can uh, learn and apply into your own training in life that gets you sustainable results. Coach Luca, peace out. I'll see you next time.